Hi everyone, Amy Collins here and it is Free Advice Friday. It is a little after 10 a.m. We got a bit of a late start this morning because of technical difficulties. And the technical difficulties are user error, definitely user error. I am here with Rebecca Ekstrom. She is from the Averill Park School District. Rebecca, say hi and tell everyone a little bit about yourself. Good morning, hi. Um, I'm Rebecca and I am a school librarian at Algonquin Middle School in Averill Park. And I've been a school librarian for 13 years and I've spent 12 years there. And I'm, I'm one of those lucky people that can say that they really love their job. And I'm really happy to be there. And um, unfortunately, not there right now because of the situation, but we're looking forward to getting back when we can. All right, all right. Well, thank you for joining me this morning. Thank you, you so and much I for having me. You and I did a webinar almost a year ago now where I asked you a number of questions about what school librarians do and how they make decisions about books. And I was wondering if you'd be willing to answer everyone else's questions about, because it's, you know, it's one thing for me to ask questions, but I wanted other people to have an opportunity to pick your brain for a little while. Is that okay with you? Sounds great. Good, 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 good. So let me get started with the first question. We had a couple people email a few questions in. And the first question I have for you is, Rebecca, it's a general question, but I want you to get as specific as you can. Where exactly do you buy your books from? Where do you actually, where do the checks go? Where do you buy them from? Okay, so um, we do the bulk of our ordering from Follett. I'm using Tidal Wave on the computer. I work with a wonderful library aide. And um, what I do is I read School Library Journal, and those reviews go into a database. And then we pull from the database to create the order. And we've also done orders directly, you know, right in Tidal Wave, which is a Follett product to assemble an order for Follett. So that's really where we do the bulk of our ordering. All right. All right. And Rebecca, where do you hear about new books? Where do you get, I'm assuming that you come up with a list before you place an order. Where do you get that list from? School Library Journal. I, I really trust their reviews. I actually have an acquaintance, Alicia Abdul at Albany High School, and she is a reviewer for School Library Journal. And I, you know, it's really a network of peers. And so um, I trust those reviews over other journals, um, there's only so much time and I read hundreds of reviews um, every few months and so I really have to be selective and that is the one journal I use for reviews. So that is a big part of uh, my decision making process. You know, looking at the verdict at the end of the review, thinking about the collection, thinking about what our students enjoy reading, thinking about the curriculum, all those decisions go into purchasing a book for the school library. So School Library Journal, definitely, I mean, I, for those of you, in case you had any glitches with the sound, um, uh, Rebecca was just talking about how important it is to her. Rebecca, I know this is just, uh, just a personal answer that you can't speak for all librarians, but you personally, I wanted to know, do you, do you ever look at the ads or any of the promotional materials through School Library Journal? I do. I do. Um... I have to say, I mean, it's uh, everyone's busy. All our jobs are busy. And so sometimes I'm, I might not look at every single ad, but sometimes there's something that catches my eye. And I have to say the ones I notice the most are next to the reviews. So I have to imagine that's um, more expensive real estate in that journal. All right, good. You know, sometimes I will see a whole leaflet put in there and I don't always have time to look at the whole entire thing, but if I see a little thing on the side that catches my eye, I might make a note for the aide I work with to say, you know, can you get me a review on this particular book? All right. Well, we have a lot of questions coming in on the Q&A. I hope you're ready and I hope you ate your breakfast because it I looks did. like I'm ready to go. for a while. I'm ready. All right. Uh, Barbara's asking, how important are study guides for librarians to purchase your book? What do study guides do for you? Study guides, um, meaning study guides to help students prepare for exams? I'm assuming that they're talking about study guides to, yes, but to help them with the book. Uh, Barbara, if you uh, want to go back okay. to the chat or the Q&A, why don't we, I, I'm going to let Rebecca answer that question, but if you would go either to the chat or the Q&A 
and tell us a little bit more about what exactly you mean by a study guide, it would probably, because I hadn't even thought of that. I was thinking more about study guides to help them with the book. Like at the end of uh, Red Badge of Courage, there's a whole bunch of questions. Um, but why don't we let Barbara uh, flesh that out? We'll move to the next question. Sure. Stephen is asking, what sorts of things would work if he wanted to connect with school librarians? For example, if he wanted to do a telecast or some sort of event at a school, um, how does that work? I mean, how do you do, do school librarians like to be connected with? What's the best way to approach them? I definitely think school librarians like to be connected with authors. Uh, I think it depends on the school librarian and the school and what, uh, what they do. Um, I know a lot of school librarians have author visits and I suppose anything that an author can do to kind of sweeten the deal for the school or the school librarian. I know some schools have arts and education money, but that gets spent on different things, sometimes connected directly to the curriculum. Um, so, you know, sometimes that money dries up, but we have a really great, we have other sources that we can pull from. So I guess um, the best way to connect. Uh, one thing that would be good, I don't know where everyone's calling in from, but in New York State, we have uh, BOCES, which are, you know, organizations um, grouped by county that really help support teachers and especially school librarians. We have a fantastic BOCES called Questar 3 School Library System. And I don't know how this would work, but those BOCES have lists of arts and education um, providers, you know, artists and, and playwrights and, um, you know, all kinds of different um, people that might do a production at a school. So I think getting on that list or contacting the BOCES might be a good way to start because those are like recommended people that the school um, will work with for different um, different events and special lectures special performances and again usually connected to the curriculum i know at my school we have a one school one book program we've been doing for a couple of years and um that is a great way for an author to really get known in a whole school district but i know that might be a difficult thing it's hard to pick a book that works for six through eight because the kids are so different from six to eight developmentally I hope that helps a little bit answer the question. It does, Rebecca, with, with that huge age uh, group span, just for you specifically, and again, guys, I'm gonna start bringing in more and more people to Free Advice Friday. Rebecca is, has, is a school librarian in the middle school area, so we're just gonna, you know, I'm just gonna pick her brain as much as she'll let me until she gets tired of me and wanders away. Um, but Rebecca, Fiction, nonfiction, what's the split, would you say, in your library between, I mean, you just talked about, I, I mean, I know from my five minutes of teaching, the difference between a sixth grader and an eighth grader, whew, but as best you can, what are you looking for, uh, for the most part, fiction versus nonfiction? Hmm. Well, I guess when I look at fiction, I think about um, our sixth grade literacy teachers because they come almost every month for a book talk. And we do humor and mystery and sci-fi and all the genres you could think about. And we just added this year um, diverse books, which has been fabulous. And so that's got me thinking about adding more and more diverse books to our population or to our collection, especially because our population in Averill Park is not so diverse. So I think about what teachers are looking for. You know, in eighth grade, there's a specific project or research paper tied to the omnivore's dilemma by Michael Pollan, and so I'm thinking about books about food and books about farming and books about food chains um, because that's what their paper's about. So I'm really thinking about the New York State curriculum, the New York State modules or something that we still follow and use at school. Um, so for, for fiction, I'm thinking about book talks. In seventh grade, we just did a slavery book talk, so I made sure to bring some slavery books home for this hiatus. Um, so it just depends on what the teachers are looking for but um, for nonfiction, like I said, food books, um, I think, you know, you might want to, the librarian really has to know their collection. So they would look at their, their different sections and think, gosh, you know, books on dinosaurs, I haven't purchased any new ones lately, or, you know, lagging behind in books about Pluto and the changes that have happened there. So it just really depends on your population. Um, what are kids interested in reading just for fun? Okay, knowing that, knowing your kids, knowing what your teachers want, in the area of fiction and nonfiction is really, really important. All right. 
Levita, you're asking a question about journals for children and adults. I'm, I'm going to ask you, can you go back to the Q&A or the chat box and give me a little more information? I need to know what you mean by journals. Do you mean the kind of journals that people write in? Uh, give me a, a longer description of what sort of books you're talking about, and I will happily ask your question of Rebecca. Rebecca, you're doing great. How are you feeling this morning? Things good. going okay? Good. Yes, thank you. All right. All right. You need a sip of tea or anything? Y'all good? I'm good. Thanks. All right. We have a lot of questions. People are loving this. Um, Anna Carner is asking if it would, and uh, Rebecca, if you don't mind, this is a question I may answer first. She's asking if it's better to postpone her book launch uh, to bookstores and library systems because of what's going on right now with the COVID-19. And, and I'm going to tell you what we're doing here in my office, and then Rebecca can tell you how she's answering it. But my experience, and I'm talking about my public libraries, I can't speak as much for Rebecca's school library, so I'm going to let her answer. But my public librarians, they're not buying every day. They are spending weeks and sometimes months making lists of books, and then they're making purchases. So postponing a, a launch to the library system doesn't make a lot of sense right now. Okay, for the next two weeks, librarians are, you know, working from home, and some of them may actually be taking a temporary leave because of budget reasons. The library has, you know, decided to put them on a furlough or not pay them for a couple of weeks. But a lot of librarians still are working, but they're working from home. So what we're doing here at New Shelves is we are still sending out announcements and newsletters and offers to librarians with the understanding that they may not see them. That, you know, they, they, so what we're doing with like, let's say our library catalogs and pitches and, and our work with Baker and Taylor and all that is we're doing it now. We're gonna keep going through this crisis and then we're gonna do it again. We're just, we're just going to start fresh when things get, get reset. So for those of you who are in one of my library mailings who are, or bookstore mailings that are saying, oh gosh, you know, I'm going to miss all these sales. You're not going to miss anything because we're going to do it twice. And that I wouldn't recommend delaying anything because this may be the new normal for a long time. And it's important to show responsibility for our fellow citizens to stay home, to act differently. But ebooks are becoming more and more important in the public library forum. The, the run on ebooks right now in the library market is so huge that some programs are actually lifting, some publishers are actually lifting their restrictions and allowing libraries to take unlimited amount of licenses at, temporarily to, to get the books out because people are staying at home and they're downloading ebooks from, from their own living rooms in their library system. Now, whether or not delaying a book launch to a bookstore makes sense, um, it depends on what you mean by a launch. If you mean, should you go out and do an author tour? No, you should stay home. Um, if I have to do Free Advice Friday from my chair, um, we should all stay home, trust me. Uh, so, uh, but in terms of actually promoting your book to libraries and to bookstores, who knows, maybe this is an opportunity that book, bookstore owners are using to get caught up on emails and to put books in a list of things that they may buy in December. Um, if you've got a book, especially you, Anna, you've got a book that's all about a cute little deer and a deer. I mean, that's, it's not a book that actually is only for a certain time of year. I'd say keep going. But Rebecca, I'm curious, uh, do you have any advice for somebody who may be launching a book as to how you, you might see people continuing their job during this crisis? Well, I definitely agree. Um, I, could, I can definitely identify with, with the way public librarians purchase books because we do it the same way. We make this giant list in this, we, we've got this giant database and then we pull from that to make a list and that goes on for months and we might only do one giant order every single year. So I, 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 that resonates with me. I wasn't sure how exactly public librarians do it, but that's how we do it as well. And so I completely, um, it makes perfect sense, everything, what you everything that you just said. Speaking from being at home, working from home, teaching from home, I do have a sixth grade technology class, so I'm trying to connect with those kids as best I can because our new trimester began and those are new students to me. Um, I'm not gonna be able to go to school and pick up that school library journal. You know, Our school is closed, so I've been thinking about what am I gonna do about book reviews? And all I can think of is, digital access, printing out reviews, and keeping up with that while we're home. Um, because as you said, this could go on for months. We don't know. There's so many unknowns right now 
in our world. And so I've been thinking about how am I going to keep up with reviews? Because when I get back, I'm going to be, depending on how long we're going, inundated with these monthly magazines and try to catch up with reviews. So that's something that I need to keep doing at home so I can be caught up depending on how long this goes. That's a great answer. Thank you. Partially because you agreed with me. And so I love that. Um, but you don't have to agree with me, guys. But we're getting a couple of very specific questions, Rebecca. And again, I know you can only speak for yourself, but I'm a big fan of the American Library Association book list the book list magazine and the reviews that they do. And I talk about that a lot. I'm a big fan of Kirkus. Mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of Forward. But these, all of these journals, these review journals also have, including Publishers Weekly, who owns School Library Journal, they all have a, pay, a paid editorial review side. Mm -hmm. There's the editorial review side and the paid editorial review side. So I was wondering if you had an opinion People are very specifically, Anna's asking about book lists. Do you ever take a look at book lists? Is that a trusted resource for you? I used to. Um, I used to look at book lists, but I stopped just because a good part of it really felt like it was for adults. And mm -hmm. the book list reviews were just, you know, the, the same books are in book lists just about were the books in School Library Journal. So, you know, it's expensive to purchase. So that's one thing that I stopped doing a few years ago. But when I started, I, I did look at book list as well, but it just seemed like it was double duty, but it was helpful if a review was sort of on the fence and I wanted to check it against something else and say, well, what does book list say? If it's a rave review and SLJs is on the fence, then I'm going to probably purchase the book if I have both reviews. So, All right. Yeah. And what about Kirkus and Forward? Do, do either of those resonate with you? I, I see Kirkus reviews online from time to time, just when I'm looking up specific books here and there. I don't actually know Forward, um, but I don't subscribe to Kirkus or look at Kirkus um, that much. Well, guys, for those of you, I mean, they're much more, I mean, I don't even think Kirkus does children's books. Well, they do occasionally, but they are geared for public librarians. It's a completely different world. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of your world, Rebecca, what is it, you were talking about how as a, a you know, the person who in many cases is part of the committee or part of the group to decide what authors come in and do events. And you were saying that schools like that, that you're mm -hmm. always, but budgets are tight. Mm -hmm. um, so if somebody had a desire to come in and do a promotion with you, what types of things do you need to see when you approach them? Do you want to see their marketing sheets, their testimonials, their, uh, do you want to see stuff about their book? Do you want to see stuff about them? If somebody was going to reach out to you and ask you to allow them to do an event or some sort of reading, uh, what, what information would you need from them to even consider starting the conversation? That's a great question. Um, one thing that I like to do is go to uh, book festivals and meet authors in person. I know that there's a lot of constraints, constraints around that. We can't all be everywhere. Um, so that's a great way for me to assess do I think this author is good with people? Do I think they're going to be good in a small group? Are they going to be, you know, do I think they would do well in a large auditorium setting, which is what we need? Um, that's typically what we look for, not so much the small groups, so that we have done that before. Um, so it's really getting a feel for that person, you know, and, and, and getting a gut sense of how would they be with kids? How would they be with uh, groups, different groups? Because some authors, have done really well in big groups at school and some not so much. So it's that. So I suppose if we can't meet at a festival, perhaps talking on the phone, perhaps, you know, doing a video conference like we're doing now just to talk to each other, I think would be helpful. But a video of someone standing up in an auditorium in front of 500 kids would also appeal to you. Yes. Yes, I would so be curious to see festivals, that. Festivals, I know that you live in a, in a very, in one of my favorite areas in the country, but um, just around your area, but I'm just curious, can you give us an example of, the, or, or any area, what type of festival you might be talking about so people can, can sure. uh, investigate the ones in their areas? Sure. Um, unfortunately, it's, it's canceled for this year, but um, Hudson, the Hudson City School District, um, in conjunction with other organizations and groups, and I'm, I, I can't remember at the moment what they are, but, and sponsors, of course, put on a large book festival in the, the city of Hudson, New York. That's wonderful. There's a ton of authors there. I've met um, 
Jason um, Reynolds was there last year, and you know, we have local authors like James Preller who come routinely. There's also a book festival in Poughkeepsie, and typically, um, oh, and there's a teen book festival in Rochester, but that ended a few years ago. That was an amazing event, amazing, geared toward teens, but I would go because it was really helpful to to, uh, to see these authors. A.S. King has been there. Um, so they're really great opportunities, usually free to uh, for me to meet these authors and um, get a good sense and see them. You know, you will typically see them in a small setting or large setting um, interacting with people. So that's very, very helpful as well. So these book festivals are, you know, if you can present at a book festival or have a table, I mean, make a connection with people. I think that's a great a great way to meet people and get your name out there in a community. Well, great. That's hugely helpful. Uh, for those of you who are just joining us or who maybe missed the email, I want to reintroduce Rebecca Ekstrom. Rebecca is a uh, is the school librarian in, uh, what is the name of your school, Rebecca? Algonquin Middle School in Averill Park. Algonquin Middle School in Averill Park. I was calling it the wrong name, sorry. Okay. I've known Rebecca for many years. I should know where she works. I'm kind of embarrassed. Um, but Rebecca is here. She is the librarian who makes the decisions in, in conjunction with other people. But she's the one who, who is here today to answer questions. Again, from her experience, she does middle school. So uh, she works with kids sixth to eighth grade. And she's, uh, you're doing a fantastic job. I am loving this. And people, more questions are coming in. Can we ask you a few more? Absolutely. Rebecca, one of the questions that a few people have asked is, how much do you share with other librarians? How much communication and talk is there amongst, mm -hmm. between you and other librarians? That's a great question. Um, so again, BOCES, the organization I spoke about earlier, they have a list serve where we can ask questions, bounce things off each other. You know, hey, we're doing one school, one book. I know you're doing it. Um, some questions about that. And at BOCES also, we gather together and we have um, opportunities for in-service, you know, learning about technology tools, conferences during the day. There's a lot of great opportunities there. So, um, and through what's happening now, we're having um, Zoom meetings uh, that anybody can join just to chat and share what they're doing at home and how they're teaching kids now and how they're providing resources to teachers. So that's a new format. That's very cool to see. So um, the listserv is a really, really big way that just a couple clicks and you can be connected to people who might have the same problem, who are helping you problem solve, who might offer solutions, ideas, thoughts, a new way to do something, a tip. Um, in the circulation system. So we definitely have a good amount of contact. And I don't know that other school districts and other states have a BOCES uh, or some organization, but it really brings everybody together. So I'm really grateful to have that. All right. Now, many of you are asking us to spell BOCES. It's all caps. I believe it's an acronym, but it's B-O-C-E-S. Correct, Rebecca? Right. Yeah. Yes. Capital B, capital O, capital C, capital E, capital S. Yeah. BOCES. Board of Cooper Cooperative Education Services, I believe it stands for. Board of Cooperative Education Services. See, that's why we have librarians come in. I don't even know this stuff. <laughs> well, you know lots of things I don't, so. Well, you know where you work. <clears throat> that's okay. <laughs> no problem. Um, we're going to go back to the two people who I asked to, to flesh out their questions a little bit, and then we'll get back to some other questions. One of the people had asked about uh, journals. She writes journals for children and adults and she wanted to know how to connect with librarians and I asked her to flesh that out a bit and apparently it's two types of journals. One with prompts that they write in and I'm wondering, I know what I think the answer is but I want to, what do you think of, do librarians use journals with prompts that people can write in? I think that would be more something an English or literacy teacher would use and I think what's hard about a book like that or uh, uh, you know, I don't think we would typically put that in our collection, not that she was asking that, because, you know, it's very difficult to have a diary or a journal or a, a book, like a Mad Libs type book where you're writing or a pop-up book. You have to think about how is this going to circulate and come back? Is it going to have writing in it? So for me, that's not so useful. But again, an English teacher would be somebody to target, literacy teachers as well. Um, 
although I think there's more English teachers out there than literacy. Literacy is something we've, we've seen cut over the years, even at my school in seventh and eighth grade. We only have them in sixth grade, but I think those would be the people you'd want to talk to to get those, to get those books into the hands of kids, those journals. And what about parents and, and other teachers? I, we talked about how you communicate with librarians. Do you have any, any outreach programs or any communication tools that you use to, sh to reach out to parents or to reach out to teachers? Or is it mainly, is it mainly you and the librarians? That's a great question. Um, we do have weekly e-blasts to parents. So if I wanted to highlight some new books that we just put in our parenting collection, if I wanted to talk about here's the next book club, the next coding club that's coming up, that's a great way. We also have had in the past an online, it used to be all paper, but you know now it's online, um, something called Jottings, which we are, we are moving away from that and, and more going to e-blasts, um, which are really, really helpful. And then sometimes I get parent emails back with questions and um, things they're wondering about. So that is um, definitely a great way to contact parents. I mean, all the parents of the whole school get that email with that information. So that's, a, you know, that's, indispensable in terms of building community and communication. And what was the other part of the question, Amy? I think I lost it. No, I, you answered it beautifully. It was, you know, reaching out to parents and, and you, that's what I, that's exactly what I needed. Now you are based in New York and every state is different. Every school district has vast swings. So I, guys, I want to be clear that Rebecca is here to share her experience with with you know, the central New York world. But um, one of the things people are asking, Rebecca, and, and you just mentioned it, so you've got a book club there. Guys, do not, do not all flood to, to Rebecca to offer your book for book clubs. But let's talk a little bit about book clubs. How do you decide what books are in book clubs and how do your book clubs run? That's a great question. We actually have a couple at my school. I'll talk about the one that I've been doing the longest. Um, that one is a book club that I run with a retired uh, literacy grade seven teacher. And um, we, you know, I inherited it. It was not something I started. And um, Cindy Dowd, this teacher worked with me um, when she was teaching and, and she still comes back for it. And that is bring any book of your choice, any middle school book of your choice. I mean, we would prefer not to have, you know, the Godfather, because we don't have that in our collection. So we want kids to bring books that they can check out. And so that's, um, you know, we have snacks and it's, they, I give them a list of all the books we talked about afterwards. But there's another book club um, that I've been running for about three or four years with the student assistance counselor. Student assistance counselors used to be called substance abuse counselors. And these are counselors that work specifically with kids who may have their own substance abuse issues, familial substance abuse um, issues. And um, she's new this year and she's fabulous. And so her predecessor and I picked out books specifically with those issues or other issues as well. So. Right now we're reading The Year of My Miraculous Reappearance by Katherine Ryan Hyde, who also wrote, you might know her from Pay It Forward. And um, we're gonna do it virtually next week, which is gonna be interesting and fun. Um, but um, we were really were looking for books that fit challenges. Um, sometimes we call it Challenges Book Club. Um, Backlash by Sarah Dare Littman, which is about suicide, anxiety, depression, and cyberbullying. Um, we read a book called Ugly by Robert Hoge about facial deformity. Um, so it just, and we, we paired that with Wonder, which a lot of kids had already read. So it really depends on, um, we really had a, a niche, you know, we really had something very specific we were looking for, for those books. So two different book clubs, um, different feels to them with the Challenges Book Club, very structured questions because we're all reading the same book. So that's what I've done um, in my career so far with book clubs. All right. Rebecca, I have a question. And guys, I know we've got three or four more. Trust me, I, I'll get to your questions, but I have a question that's a little, it's gonna, it's a little bit of a left turn. But when Rebecca and I were talking during the webinar, and for those of you who want even more detailed information, please go to my YouTube channel. If you go to youtube.com slash Amy Collins and just search the word library, it's gonna take you right to Rebecca's interview. We talked for an hour of a very specific 
uh, book purchasing. We got very, very detailed. But Rebecca, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about bindings. I, um, and again, it, it changes public. I'm a public library person. I spend all of my time talking to public librarians. But I get so many questions about school libraries that I'm so grateful that you came on today. Let's talk a little bit, if we can, about what you like to see in a book binding. Do you take in paperbacks? Do you need a special binding? Do you need a special? Tell me what you need. If, if a book is going to be in your library, what can a publisher do to make it as um, uh, attractive to you as possible in terms of actually producing the book? I guess in that case, really having different options, different levels. You asked about paperbacks. We do have some in our collection, but they, as you could imagine, they just don't last. And we are very fortunate to have bindery money. We work with Bridgeport Bindery, which I say to the kids is the book hospital. And um, of course they fix up the books. Um, so it's really having those different options, those different levels. I mean, for us, I mean, think about how much harder a kid is on a book than an adult. I mean, I, I just have to, having observed kids at school, um, they're really, they can be really rough on the books. So having a strong binding or having the different options, that is really what we're looking for. The only reason we've really put a few paperbacks in our collection is because they might have been freebies from the Scholastic Book Fair. And they have those trade bindings, right, which are not going to last for us. So we have to really be um, selective. But of course, you know, you have to, you have to think about if it's, a, if it's a slavery book, and I know it's gonna be used for a long time in the curriculum, having a better binding is gonna be better. You know, if I have um, a book that's not gonna be used as much, I don't need the very best binding, but I don't want a paperback either. So tell me again the name of the book hospital. What is the name of that company? Bridgeport Bindery. All right. Well, guys, uh, again, I know very little about school libraries. I have spent 47 out of my 52 years avoiding children. Uh, the minute I was actually able to walk down the street, I stayed as far away from them as possible. So I can't help, but Rebecca's giving you some gold here, some absolute gold. So check out Bridgepoint Bindery. I, I mean, I'm not saying that, you know, they can, they can help, but these are the sorts of things you need to know if schools, if school libraries are important to you. Rebecca, working with teachers, um, Barbara has some, some uh, teacher guides that are compliant with educational common core standards nationally. And Stephen's got a couple questions about how you might or might not work with, with the teachers in your school system. Do you have a lot of interactions and suggestions with teachers? Do you take in materials for them? I do. So um, I think about, again, what is their curriculum like? What, do our need, what are our needs in the library? Um, for example, a teacher in eighth grade in a theater class needed books on Shakespeare, and we pulled books, and I thought, wow, we need to get some newer books in this area. Some of them were, were older and probably needed to be weeded, but I don't want to do that until I get some newer ones. So um, it is thinking about what they might need, um, what they need now. You know, I love it when a teacher has a specific request it might be for a book. It might be um, for a, a, you know, a magazine. We do still have a magazine budget at school. Um, so it really depends on what teachers need, what kind of projects are they working on. It might be a digital resource that they're looking for. Um, so it all really depends on what's going on in their classroom. And we do, as I said before, um, we, we have adopted the New York State modules and some schools um, have moved away from that, but we are still using those modules. I don't know how much longer we will. Uh, you know, I know the pendulum swings back and forth in education and things change, but that's something that we're still using right now and we have used for um, several years. All right. All right. Annette is asking about cataloging and publication data blocks. Do, you, do school librarians, do you use, do you, does that information or does the o, OCLC database enter into your, your world at all? Okay, so um, what we do is, so I, I feel like that's two questions, so I'm going to just speak to one part first about, the, I guess, data blocks. Um, I, I think what she means is the, um, you know, 
all the mark records. So we do an order and then the person at BOCES will ask, we'll, we'll say that she has the download and when would we like it? And so then she does that. She imports all the records into our system. Um, and guys, Mark is M-A-R-C. It ends with this M-A-R-C. Keep going, Rebecca. Sorry. Yeah, sure. No problem. And the other question, so the library aid I work with will we'll go to OCLC for information. Um, she does the cataloging. I don't do that at school. I mainly am more of the teaching side and purchasing books and things like that. So she does more of the clerical work. A lot of what she does is on the computer. So she, she would use that product, that website. And for those of you who are publishers who are actually publishing your own book, this answer tells me that I can now confidently say this. See, again, I only know public libraries, but public libraries use both the MARC database. They, they go into worldcat.org at the OCLC level and a catalog and publication data block, normally for larger publishers, which are provided and actually started through the Library of Congress, you can actually get them done by approved librarians. My favorite one is done through the Donahue Group, D-O-N-O-G-H-U-E, I believe, but it's, um, it's dgi-inc.com. Their website is dgi-inc.com. And for, I think, just under $100, they will not only uh, vet and create a very, a very pristine, well done, I mean, their research is, is wonderful. The, these librarians have been trained by the best, but they are one of the only two companies in the United States that are allowed to put their blocks into the MARC database. Mm -hmm. So for those of you publishers who want to get the books cataloged properly, may I recommend you check out DGI, Donahue Group Incorporated. And I didn't know that school librarians used them. I'm glad to hear it. Um, but Annette, for, and for those of you who are curious, you're not eligible for the Library of Congress to give you a number or for them to work with you on a CIP, Catalog and Publication Block, data block, if you're a small house. You have to have at least four books by a minimum of three different authors. And if that's the case, then you need what's called a PCIP, a Publisher Catalog and Publication Block. Those are done by vetted approved vendors and the, the one, and unfortunately, a lot of them have gone out of business in the last few years. Unique Books used to do it. But now, uh, Donahue Group is the one that I recommend. Thank you, Rebecca. I appreciate that. Uh, let's see here. Okay, we already answered that question. Uh, Barbara's asking, how do you feel about donated books, about people who want to donate or give you free books? Mm. That's another great question. That, that's difficult. You know, it's difficult because um, you don't want to um, not accept the donation. It's always a very generous thing for someone to donate their property, donate books, but sometimes they just don't fit in the curriculum. They might, or excuse me, in the collection, they might be older books. One thing I have in my office is um, stockpiles of paperbacks that teachers have as cast offs or um, things that I've picked up that I think might be good, we um, are thinking about and hopefully having a little free library at school. So I'm trying to kind of, you know, stockpile books for that. So sometimes what I say to parents or students or people donating is, would it be okay if I use some of these books instead of in the school library, could I give them to teachers for their silent reading collection? Would that be okay with you to give to their classroom collections? because I don't want people who are donating to, um, I want them to understand they might not end up on the shelves, but we want them in, in kids' hands for sure. So that's, that's really what I do with donated books, is I, I usually don't put them in the collection. They usually end up um, in teachers' rooms or I, I might be able to give them to students. Sometimes we have kids who over and over and over lose books. You know, every so often we have a student that just can't hold on to a library book. And so instead of like, you know, they and they might not be able to pay for it to replace it. They might not be able to um, compensate. So I will give them a book from that collection that they can pick and just if it's gone, it's gone. All right. I want to remind everyone that Rebecca Ekstrom from the Algonquin School in Averill Park, New York. Did I get that right, Rebecca? Got it. Oh, yep. phew. 
Uh, she is here visiting with us today and answering questions about being a school librarian. If you joined us late, this replay will be available on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Amy Collins. And you can always see our replays at amysadvice.com. So signing up for our live is great, but if you, I mean, not everyone gets up at this hour if you're in different parts of the world. Uh, Wendy Jones, I know that you've been up for quite a while. I see you there. Uh, but I'm afraid that Rebecca can only answer questions about what's going on in New York. For those of you who are curious if, if these things are also true in Washington state or in Scotland. Um, we just don't know. I believe a large number of them are, uh, but for instance, the, the name of the bindery company that she uses, there's, there's two main bindery companies in the U.S., correct, Rebecca? I actually, um, I don't know who they are. Is Bridgeport one of them? I'm not sure. Yes, Bridgeport is okay. one, and then, okay, so maybe there's just one now, but there were two, I thought. Um, but uh, so guys, and I know Baker and Taylor also has a, uh, a library binding, not a service though, they're not a hospital, they don't fix books, but they, they work with a couple companies that will um, provide books in a library binding. Mm -hmm. Rebecca, for those who are curious, what is a library binding? What is the difference between that and a regular hardcover? Um, I believe that it's just a much, much stronger binding. Um, you know, it's going to last a lot longer. It's going to be made of better quality materials. You can kind of feel it when you crack open a book. You know, you can kind of feel the weakness or the strength of the book. Um, mm -hmm. And it's just, it's going to, it's going to last a long time. It's going to last through any abuse that has happened to the book. Um, it's going to be a much, much better product. And for us, that's really, really important because you, you know, think about all the circulations. It's something that's much different if you just have a book that's your own personal book. All right. Rebecca, we have four more questions and 12 minutes. Is there any chance we can try and plow through these? Sounds good. You have been so gracious today and I am so thrilled that you, thank you for joining us today. Guys, remember, Rebecca's here, she's on furlough, or she's, out, she's working from home, she's not on furlough from the schools, uh, which gives her an opportunity to answer our questions. And over the next few weeks, I'm going to have as many people on Free Advice Friday as I can. Rebecca, now this one is just your opinion. Uh, she's asking your opinion. We've got an author named Caroline who wants to know if having a gun on the cover or a violent image on her cover, is that a big no-no for you? Her protagonist is holding a gun on her cover, but the actual story, the writing has very little violence. And as a follow-up question, I'd like to ask, do you, if you are reading in reviews and, and in third-party notes that a book has some violence, where's your line for you? So Amy, I'm sorry, I, I heard Caroline's question, but I didn't hear yours. Do you want me to just answer Caroline's right now? That just means the universe doesn't want mine answered, so you go right ahead and answer Caroline. I think my computer is uh, my computer is buffering and freezing. I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry about um, so Caroline's question was there's somebody on the cover of the book holding a gun, but the gun has very little violence. So um, I guess I would be that's a that's a that's really I'm just thinking for a minute here. Um, that would be a book that if I did purchase it, that I would, um, I think that book would be attractive to a seventh grader or a sixth grader. Um, the cover, I mean, think about how visual many of us are. The covers are so important and it's always disappointing. I know that authors don't have a lot of choice in decision-making about the covers. Um, you know, Rose Kent's book, Rocky Road, has a scoop of sh like orange sherbet on the cover. It doesn't make any sense, right? So we do have these covers that we can't always choose. Um, so I think that it sounds like that book could be read by a younger student, but at first glance, I suppose somebody might look at the cover and think that it was full of violence, you know? Um, I mean, that's a really interesting question. I, I guess I would really want to read a review and want to know more about what the book was about before thinking right. about purchasing it and, and what grade would I book talk that book for? Well, and Caroline did then jump in to say it is mainly for older teens, so that makes sense. Right, right. All right, a couple more questions. Anna is asking about audio. Does audio, do audio books factor into your world at all? 
So audiobooks, um, we don't have too many in our collection. We have some playaways that were purchased for the special ed department several years ago that we definitely um, don't lend out as much as I'd like to see them being lent out. Um, but we don't have too many audiobooks in our collection. Um, so again, the um, Questar 3 school library system BOCES has purchased ebooks and audiobooks that um, Rensselaer County, which is my county, Columbia and Green all use. So all the schools in those three counties through BOCES have access to ebooks and audiobooks. So we don't per se purchase too many of those, but kids do have access to many, many audiobooks and ebooks. All right. That's, and how, and we talked about audiobooks. How are you finding ebooks are being received by that age group? So what I'm hearing, um, I'm hearing high school kids read a lot of ebooks. I'm not having as much luck at the middle school level with ebooks. When a student comes up to the desk and they ask if we have a particular book, and I'll say, you know, we do own it, but I'm sorry, it's checked out right now. But look, there's an ebook um, in the, for that same book. They're often like 90% of the time they're not interested, and I hope that this hiatus that we're having right now will turn some kids on to ebooks. Um, what, that's one thing that I'm really, we're really trying to promote heavily from home. Um, my principal has daily announcements every day to create connection and continuity. And one thing he wanted to do, which is great, was have some slides featuring like, what are teachers reading? What am I reading? Then kids tell us what they're reading and to promote Sora which is um, replacing overdrive for schools. That's, you know, you guys might know Libby is the public library app, Sora is for schools. And so that's something that's newer. And now um, it's uh, Google authenticated, so kids don't even need a password. So I'm really trying to heavily promote those right now so that kids can keep reading. Because, you know, if you know about the summer slide in the summer when kids don't read so much, they lose skills. I don't want that same thing to happen to them right now. That's mm -hmm. the concern. So we're really trying to promote those as much as we can. Oh, that's great. And now I thought of an opportunity. That's I'm, now we're going to, you and I will have to talk about how to promote eBooks for that age group. And, and so that by the time they're in high school, they're obsessed with them. Sounds I love great. eBooks. I think they are the, the, are the environmental safest and smartest choice. I, I, the, the impact on the environment that comes from paper books, totally necessary up till now, but it's not necessary anymore. And I am an enormous fan of eBooks. I, I hope we all, during this horrible time, when paper books are actually not always 100% safe to pass between people, that more and more of us turn to eBooks. Mm -hmm. All right, guys, we've got a few more minutes before the top of the hour. Again, this is Rebecca Ekstrom. And Rebecca, as a school librarian, you're pretty cool. But as a friend and as somebody who's an expert now, I mean, I, I hope you'll come back. People are loving these questions. You're getting all sorts of hearts and loves here on the, the thing. This, there will be a replay of this, guys, at amysadvice.com. Give me a couple of hours to get it done. I've got an interview with Wendy Jones in five minutes that I've got. <laughs> in five minutes, I'm going to be on uh, uh, being interviewed by Wendy Jones for her podcast. Make sure you check out Wendy H. Jones's podcast when you get a chance. She's got one about book marketing I love. Rebecca, I have one final question for you, and then I will let you get on with your day. Are there any organizations or newsletters? Is there anything that school librarians join? Are, is there a newsletter you can tell people about that, that school librarians pretty much nationally all subscribe to? Is there an organization that you belong to? Uh, can you tell me a little bit about your professional organizations and give us some names so that people can just be aware of what it is your industry, uh, what they work with. Sure, sure. And I'm sorry, there were times that I couldn't hear you. My computer is doing a little bit of buffering and freezing. Um, so I'm sorry if I was just uh, not reacting to something. Um, but I, yeah, I did hear your question. And we have um, NYLA, New York Library Association. And there's a division in there called CISL. Um, and that is just for school librarians. We also have CASDA that provides professional development. So um, there are others as well. I'm trying to think of the others at the moment. Ensla well, would you, is another. Would you be willing to spell those um, three? So there are ones specific to New York. 
um, that we do receive um, e-newsletters. And the BOCES, BOCES is very, very good about letting us know about conferences they might be having, uh, opportunities to present at their conferences, and different events and things like that. So um, author events and when author, you know, authors coming to speak just to librarians. So those are very useful as well. Great. Rebecca, would you be willing to spell CISL for us? Sure, S S uh, S S L, I believe. Oh, okay. CISL. All yeah. right. And the the other organizations, how do you spell uh, those? CASDA, C A S D A, and then NYLA is just N Y L A. Well, everyone, again, this has been Rebecca Ekstrom uh, from the Algonquin School in Avril Park, New York. Thank you so much for joining me, Rebecca. I cannot thank you enough for giving us this time. Guys, this is Free Advice Friday. It's the top of the hour, and I'm going to be doing my check-in this afternoon. Those of you who are following my daily check-ins with amysadvice.com, I hope you did your homework assignment from yesterday, because today we're going to get those 12 authors going. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go to youtube.com slash amycollins and uh, watch yesterday's check-in and you can join us. We're, uh, we're, we're doing a project together and uh, totally free to join. Rebecca, thank you for joining me and I wanna welcome everyone who's new to Free Advice Friday. We're getting new followers and new attendees every week. This is free every Friday. It's a free hour of consulting where we answer all your questions and you can sign up and ask your friends to sign up to join us at amysadvice.com. With that, I will wish you a happy Friday and a good weekend, and I will see you guys soon at Free Advice Friday.